I want to go back to Genesis uh, chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. We've looked at this a little bit, but I want to follow up on a few of these things. In chapter 2 of Genesis in the creation account, we read in verse 18 these words, and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable or suitable for him. And so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Chapter 3 then introduces this ominous note that we've already heard from R.C. Sproul the Younger. Uh, where this sense of foreboding is introduced in the text where we read, now the serpent was more cunning or crafty than any beast of the field. And then we read the account of the cunning way in which he sought to seduce our first parents with the lies that they t he told them. And then we read in verse 6 of chapter 3, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, before I go on, do we read this account? of the first transgression of the fall of the human race, the question I want us to look at at this moment is this question, what was the first immediate consequence of the fall of the human race? We don't have to guess the answer to that because Scripture provides it. We read in verse 7 of chapter 3, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? And so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, there's so much contained here in this biblical record of the fall of humanity. But at the very end of chapter 2 of Genesis, after we have the creation narrative of the creation of man and woman, and how they are to cleave to one another and be one flesh. The very last verse 
of chapter 2 is jarring. It sort of hangs there like a dangling participle or seems to be attached to chapter 2 as kind of a concluding unscientific postscript where we read these words, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now, how can you read that and not step back from the text and say, what's that all about? Now, what's the significance of the fact that God created man and woman naked and in their nudity, in their bare exposure, there was no embarrassment, no shame. Well, one of the interesting things that we can do in Scripture is examine the nakedness motif throughout the whole of the Bible. It's a fascinating subject. I have a chapter on it in my book, If There's a God, Why Are There Atheists?, because it's uh, profound how the metaphor of nakedness functions in biblical and redemptive history. I'm supposed to speak of barriers to intimacy, and I loved what uh, Ken said, that intimate marriage is indeed a redundancy. If marriage is marriage, there is, by the very nature of the union, a certain inescapable intimacy. Although Ken indicated there can be degrees of that intimacy, and that intimacy can be the occasion of the great blessedness of marriage, or it can also be the occasion of its destruction. Listening to the polls that are taken, which I usually don't pay much attention to, of people who have been divorced, and when they were asked to say what were the factors that caused them to end their marriages, there are four common reasons presented by people. Now, I don't put a whole lot of stock in self-diagnosis, but what the self-diagnosis is that ranking number four on the list of things that contribute to the breakup of marriage is problems with in-laws. That's number four, but it's in the top five, problems with in-laws. You know, there's a saying in our culture that behind every great man there is a woman who was convinced he'd never make it, his mother-in-law. No man has ever been born that was worthy to be the husband of his in-law's daughter, and no daughter has ever been born that has been worthy to be the wife of the husband's parents in their eyes. And so family problems can create great tension within marriages. We know that, but I'm not going to talk about that. Number three is money management. If two people get married, no matter how much money they have between them, even if they're both billionaires, they still have tensions on how to use that money because the potential desires for spending in a marriage are infinite and the family resources are finite, because every dollar that is spent here is a lost opportunity there. So there will always be that tension between a new washing machine and new golf clubs. <laughs> I don't know why my wife always wanted golf clubs when I wanted a washing machine. <laughs> But we know about those tensions and barriers to intimacy that come up with respect to economics. The second most frequent reason that people give for the destruction of their marriages is sexual 
incompatibility. Conflicts over the conjugal dimension of marriage. I'm not going to talk about that either. But the number one reason that couples give for the dissolution of their marriage, marriages, is failure of communication. And so at the heart of a godly, intimate marriage must be some healthy kind of communication. And that's why I started this this, mor uh, this, this, after this morning, this afternoon, this afternoon, by reading this text, this strange text about nakedness. Why is it that Adam and Eve were described as being naked and unashamed and what in the world does that have to do with a godly marriage? As I look out in this uh, great church this afternoon, I notice that there are many people here that I know, but also many people that I don't know. And I don't know who your favorite football team is and all of that. I know that everybody's dressed in their own individual and unique way. But as I look out here in this congregation, I've not yet seen anyone who's nude. You're all dressed, and I'm glad for that. Because ever since the fall, there's a certain shame or embarrassment that attaches itself to nakedness. Now, I know we live in a culture this side of the sexual revolution where we have a narcissistic, infantile, puerile preoccupation with human nudity so that pornography becomes a multi-billion dollar business and magazines go over the edge with portraying the naked human body, male and female. We see constant nudity displayed on the movie screens and, and so on. We even have this phenomenon in our culture where we have major sporting events that are interrupted by streakers, where somebody who's halfway out of their mind takes off their clothes and runs across the football field. But I've always noticed that in spite of this preoccupation with nudity, that shower curtains and window blinds are still staples in our commercial uh, environment. And I also notice that those who like to don their clothes at football games and go on the field are called streakers rather than strollers. <laughs> because there still is this sense where people don't want to be caught naked in public. Now that's deeply rooted in the human condition. And it was not always that way. In creation, we wore no clothes. Several decades ago, an anthropologist by the name of Desmond Morris wrote a best-selling book called <clears throat> The Naked Ape. And in that book, Morris indicated that there were some 80-some uh, sp species of primate apes, and among those 80 species, there's only one primate ape in the zoological register of this world that wears artificial clothing. And of course, he was referring to animal homo sapiens. Now, we could have gone beyond the primates and looked at the rest of the animal kingdom and say, not only are people the only ones who wear artificial clothing among the apes, but we're the only ones that wear artificial clothing among the whole animal kingdom. The birds and the bees, the duck-billed platypuses, the polar bears, the elephants, and all the rest 
go about naked. And they don't seem to be embarrassed by it. Now you will see occasionally some animals wearing artificial clothing. You go to Jackson Square in New Orleans, and you may see the mules and the horses that are drawing the carts there wearing hats where holes have been cut out, where their big ears can go through the holes. But those are human hats made by human beings. I've yet to see a hat manufacturing company owned and operated by mules, although I have seen some companies owned and operated by jackasses. Or sometimes in the frozen north, our dogs may be seen wearing sweaters and mufflers, but once again, they're fashioned by people for their pets. But in the whole realm of life, we alone wear clothes. Why? We can't explain that simply in I saw that. It's going to make me an Arminian. <laughs> the stroke was in the brain stem, and it's connected to the optic nerve, and that's why the uh, flash things make me crazy. So please don't use those flashes, okay? Now, that's the last time I'm asking nice, right? We beheaded somebody earlier. But we don't wear clothes simply for utilitarian purposes to keep warm. We wear clothes not just to look pretty, but we wear clothes primarily to hide our nakedness. As soon as sin entered into the world, the first conscious realization of human guilt was an awareness of nakedness. As I read in chapter 3, and the man and the woman knew that they were naked, and they were ashamed. And what did they do as soon as they were ashamed? Is they went into hiding. They used fig leaves to cover themselves, because suddenly they were embarrassed and did not want to be seen as they were. When they heard God walking in the cool of the day in the garden, instead of rushing to Him in sheer delight to fellowship with Him, they fled from Him. They hid from Him. And when God said, why are you hiding? They said, because we're naked and we're ashamed. Who told you? that you were naked. Did you eat of that tree? You see, there was an instant link between sin and shame. And ever since that, the world has been involved in Eden Gate, the attempt to cover up our embarrassment and a desire to hide who we really are. One of the great acts of mercy that we read in the Bible that is a metaphor for the whole plan of divine redemption. The very first act of redemption was that God in His mercy did not slay Adam and Eve as He warned them, but instead He made clothes for them. He could have said, you're embarrassed because you're naked? Too bad. You can just walk the face of the earth and let everybody look at your nakedness, and you can stay in your shame. But instead, He provided a covering. And that, in a sense, is the precursor of the gospel, where God provides the ultimate covering of our nakedness when He clothes us with the righteousness of Christ. But again, what does this have to do with intimacy in marriage? 
ever since Eden, ever since we became uncomfortable with our nakedness, ever since the moment that we did not want everybody in the world to know what we really are, ever since we've gone into hiding, there has been a kind of primordial nostalgia, a desire to find a place where once more we can be naked and unashamed, a place where we can be known without a mask, without concealment, without hiding in the shadows. And God has provided that place in the sanctity of marriage. God has provided a locale where once again His creatures can take off their clothes, be naked, and unashamed. You know, in talking about the revolution of marriage, and more people are living together now and instead of being married and so on, and we can look at that and say, tisk tisk, that's so immoral, which it is, it's treason against the Creator. But in addition to the immorality of that is the abject foolishness of it. I can't believe a woman would make herself naked in front of a man who has never committed himself before God for her whole life and her whole welfare. She's in a, the most vulnerable situation she could possibly be in on this planet. And the man says, oh, come on, be naked. It's safe. It's not safe, and people are getting violated beyond belief. But when the Bible uses the metaphor of naked, nakedness, it is not talking simply about the absence of clothes. It goes beyond that. Again, when the Bible speaks of the sexual union between the husband and the wife, the word that is used is the word to know. We read, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. Or Abraham knew his, his wife, and she conceived. Now, that doesn't mean that they were simply introduced to one another, and on the basis of that external acquaintanceship, suddenly pregnancy emerged, where the Bible says, Madam, I'm Adam, and Eve is pregnant now. No. Again, nor is the Bible just indulging in euphemisms to avoid being candid about the sexual union between the man and the woman. But there is something profoundly important and profoundly theological about using the verb to know to capture the intimacy of marriage. Because what happens in the union of two people in the context of marriage is an unveiling, a disrobing, not only of the body, dear friends but of the soul, of the mind, of the heart. And there's irony involved here with this crazy tradition we have of dating. Think about how the dating business goes. The man and the woman have this date or this agreement to go out. And so in preparation for that, the man uses his uh, deodorant. He shaves as carefully as he can. He uses his aftershave. 
He wears his best attire, makes sure that his shoes are shined. I'm not talking about going to church now. I'm talking about going to go out with a girl. Likewise, the girl is at home, and she combs her hair, applies her makeup, gets her most provocative dress, because both of these people are profoundly interested in making a great impression on the other person the first time they go out. So they go out, and things go well, and they decide to have a second date, and a third date, and a fourth date, and a fifth date. Now things look like they're beginning to develop seriously. And now we start seeing a new dimension in the relationship. You begin to wonder, well, will she really like me if I'm not wearing my deodorant? Will she really be uh, impressed by me if I don't have my aftershave lotion or if I didn't shave too closely today? And she's worried, what if he ever sees me with my hair up? And so you begin to test the water. You begin to reveal a little bit more of each other to each other to see if it's safe. You begin to confess sins that you've committed long ago and far away. But still the game is on of hide and go seek. And then finally, you get married. And in that environment that God has provided for you, the removal of the mask can continue, or you will begin to build new barriers of concealment. And here's what destroys more marriages than anything, that after you're married, and you're supposed to be naked and unashamed, you go back into hiding. You begin to lie to each other. You begin to conceal your thoughts, your emotions, your prayers, your concerns from each other. Kierkegaard, the Danish existentialist, the gadfly, talks about uh, this description of human beings. He said, the, the paradoxical character of nakedness is reflected in the idea of man as the homo absconditus. Luther used the term deus absconditus. What are you doing with that, Chuck? <laughs> he, he, he didn't quit, did he? <laughs> the deus absconditus refers to the hiddenness of God. And now Kierkegaard turns that around and speaks of homo absconditus, the hiddenness of man. And he says that there is an inherent need of an absconditus dimension in human beings. He said, for a person to be fully involved in life in the existential realm, he has to get out of the masquerade. He says in his book, Either Or, life is a masquerade. You'll explain, and for you, this is inexhaustible material for amusement. And so far, no one has succeeded in knowing you. Every re revelation you make of yourself is an illusion. It's only that, that way that you want people to see you that you show yourself. But your real occupation consists in preserving your hiding place, and you succeed in doing that, for your mask is the most enigmatic of all. In fact, you are nothing. You are merely relation. To a fawn shepherdess, you hold out a languishing hand, and instantly you are masked in all possible bucolic sentimentality. A reverend spiritual father, you deceive with a brotherly kiss. Do you not know? that there comes a midnight hour when everyone has to throw off his mask? Do you think that life will always let itself be mocked? Do you think that you can slip away from the party just before midnight, before the coach turns into a pumpkin? 
Now, the thing that we understand as Christians is that there is nothing secret that will not be revealed, and that God knows everything there is conceivably to know about us. In fact, that is the great thing about the Christian life, is to come to that place where you know that God knows you and that He loves you. And He loves you not because He knows you, but He loves you in spite of the fact that He knows you. And that's what's supposed to be mirrored in the human relationship of marriage. Fifty percent of our people today have marriages that end in divorce. How do you feel when you realize that the human being with whom you have been most intimate, who knows more about you than any other person on this planet has now rejected you. Do you see how, why divorce is so destructive and so painful to people? Because the intimacy has been shattered. Because somebody doesn't like what they found under the fig leaves. I always say the greatest evidence in this world that I've experienced of the love of God is the fact that the person who knows me better than anyone else in the world is my wife. And guess what? She loves me. You talk about amazing grace. <laughs> there it is. And still, she doesn't know me completely, and I don't know her completely, but I want to. I find that the more I know her, it really is true, the more I know her, the more I love her, and the more I want to know about her. And I have found out this out, too, that I believe that every human being in this world has a life that is worth writing a best-selling novel about. There's so much drama, so much interest, so much complex profundity in every single human being in this world that if we would set ourselves to the task of getting to know them, we would have more than a wealth of material to write a dramatic novel. But that's not the priority. I heard my son this morning, and I know that he lives what he was talking about. I've never seen anybody like it who has made it his life's vocation to be a husband and a father. He didn't get it from me. I don't know where he got it. But it's, it's something really to behold. But we will spend a fortune and years of our work to study a particular subject, to get a degree in a certain field so that we can earn our living in a particular endeavor. It might be mathematics, it might be philosophy, it might be English, it might be economics, it might be business, whatever it is. We apply so much effort to learning the discipline that we're studying, to prepare ourselves to life. But we won't walk across the living room to learn who our wife is or who our husband is. The greatest treasure that God has given to us in this world. You know, before God ever says, husbands, love your wives, the mandate in creation basically is this, husbands, know your wives like Adam knew Eve. 
like Abraham knew Sarah, like Jesus knows the church. One of the tragedies of 20th century philosophy was the existential philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre, who was one of the most brilliant thinkers of that era, but twisted and distorted. He said, the essence of being human is to be a subject, and what destroys us is when we are reduced by other people to the level of an object. He talks about the fact that people stare at each other, and we know that in polite company we're supposed to meet the gaze of other people if we see them on the sidewalk or if we meet them in the hall, but we're not supposed to stand there and stare at them. If I would just look at one person in this congregation for 45 minutes in a sermon, just lock my eyes on that person and relentlessly preach my whole sermon to that person, if that person wouldn't leave before the end of 45 minutes, I'd be amazed, but if they would want to get me out of there after 45 minutes because I've reduced them to an object. This is the reason why the number one fear, phobia that people have in America is public speaking. Because while I'm supposed to make contact with all of you, all of you are fixing your gaze on one of me. And if I stop to think about it, I know that you're not just listening to what I'm saying, but you're looking at my tie, you're looking at my coat, you're looking at my gestures, why does he wear his hair like that? And all of that business is going on. I'm subjecting myself to your moment-by-moment -moment critique of me. I'm glad I have my clothes on. <laughs> and Sartre said, that's what we can't stand. We can't stand to be submitted to the stare of other people where we're dehumanized depersonalized. We become like monkeys in the zoo or pieces of art in the museum wall. It's perfectly okay to go to the Louvre and sit in a bench and stare at a painting for hours. But don't do that to the painter or you'll get arrested. Now he just elevates that. He said, if there is a God, our lives are a living hell because beneath the gaze of God, every blemish, every spot is made known, and I have to live in the discomfort of my embarrassment. Therefore, there can't be a God, because life under the gaze of an omniscient God would be intolerable. You see, what Sartre reveals is interesting. You see, people by nature do not want God to look at them. We want God not to look at us, but to overlook us. The great, the great tragedy is that Sartre never experienced the redemptive gaze of God, like David did. David was so thrilled that even in his great penitence, he says, Oh God, you have searched me and you have known me. And he goes on and says, God, continue to search me. See if there's any wicked way in me. I want you to know me. I don't want to hide anything from you. Oh God, I want to be naked before you and be unashamed. One of the most pessimistic and cynical pieces of drama that, were, that was ever written was Sartre's play entitled No Exit. Here's what he says at the end of the play, where one of the characters is in this room and he's stroking this bronze statue. He says, this bronze. Yes, now's the moment. I'm looking at this thing on the mantelpiece, and I understand that I'm in hell. Oh, everything's been thought out beforehand. They knew I'd stand at this fireplace stroking this thing of bronze with all of those eyes of everybody else in the room intent on me, devouring me. He swings around abruptly, 
What? There's only two of you? I thought there were more, many more. So this is hell. I'd never have believed it. You remember all that things that we were told about the torture chambers, the fire, the brimstone, the burning marl, old wives' tales. There's no need for red hot pokers. Hell is other people. That's a man who never found a place where he could be naked and unashamed. This is what R.C. Jr. was talking about here, that the chief business of marriage is knowing each other in the context of grace, where my wife becomes Christ for me, and I am to be Christ to her, so that she can be naked, not just in body, but in her mind, in her life, in her soul, with me, and know that she's safe. As she makes me feel safe, as she knows more and more and more and more about me, husbands, know your wives. Give them a place where they can be naked without fear. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your mercy and grace that You have covered our guilt, that You've given us the gaze that says You know us, but You love us anyway. We pray that we may mirror and reflect that redemption in our marriages, for our sakes and for Christ's sake. Amen.